first piece. Really? You wear something else. <laughs> is that Blackwood? Sure. Sorry? Is that is that Blackwood? No, no, it's um Laburnum? Laburnum. I think Laburnum would be very much like black locust. It's it is very much like it. We've got the sapwood round the top of the ring yeah. and the blackwood down. And uh it was wet when I turned it. Very first time somebody said, Well, you're better better off practicing on wet wood than dry wood. So I turned it and the next morning I came down and it had gone that shape. <laughs> <laughs> and good morning, everybody. This is Wood Turner's weekly coffee hour number 128 for November 17th. Um Oh, John, sorry. <laughs> it didn't keep you on. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It keeps the person who does the muting on. So that's what happened. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it is what it is. You know, there's so many little nuances in this, you know, and we, we sort of get the idea, well, you know, this is CBS News. It matters, you know. <laughs> It'll be fine. It doesn't take long to sort it out. Um, let me see. This is a show and tell morning. I the, the the relevant announcement first is there will be no coffee hour next week, which is Thanksgiving Day, uh, but we will resume the we the following week. Uh, I'm not sure what our guest star for December will be, but I'll let you know as soon as I find one. Mark Sfiri told me this morning he had a lot of fun with us last week. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. I posted the video from that yesterday. Any comments you want to make about Mark or anything you want to convey to him? I I wanted to tell him that. I thought of all the woodturners that carved, he blended the two skills very seamlessly. I meant to tell him that, but we ran out of conversation time. Do you guys tend to agree with that? Is some you can tell when a guy turns and then when he carves on top of that. That's embellishment. But Mark, he just blended them. The one bowl, you know, that he turned and had two lips on it. Like, yeah, I just thought he did seamless work. So Anybody else? Okay. Um, let me see. This is a show and tell morning. As usual, we'll use Ray's hand. Um, uh, this morning, I'm going to depart a little bit, I think, from uh, protocol in that uh, I haven't really been turning for about the last year to the health reasons. And I got back into it in the last couple of weeks and been down in the shop a lot. And I made some stuff and I'd like to show you, show it to you quickly. And uh, we'll start with that. And because of some of the problems I have, we'll go to Don after that, because he's going to talk about power sanding, which is something I seem to desperately need to know more about. Um, is that okay with you guys as I, as I go forward? Okay. Um, let me see if I know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do. Well, you, I'm coming through to you guys as speaker view, aren't I? Yeah. Because I don't have uh, my desktop computer crapped out, so I'm actually in the in the dining room or in the kitchen on my laptop. So I don't have the usual accoutrements of second screens and switches and things like that. Your audio um, and video is very good, John. Good, thank you. So, so I turned this one. This is a pear wood bowl, and this is I almost never twice turn. In fact, I it's just not a thing I do, and I'm not really a bowl turner either. Uh, but so, but I had, I turned this last year sometime before when I was last turning more than a year ago. And it, the feature about it is down in the center of the bottom is there's a knot and a whole gnarly patch of grain because it's right out of a crotch in a Bradford, Bradford pear. Um, and it's got water locks on it, but I haven't buffed it and polished it. And I'm quite happy with it, except for the scratch that there is around the rim that I didn't see until after I was done with the water locks. And it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a sanding insufficiency and it's annoying as hell. Um, that's at least my own, my own critique of it. So let me see, I gotta hold that so it doesn't wave around and it doesn't get out in the, uh, tangle up in the background. So that's a twice turned one. And then Don Brubaker last spring gave us some U wood and I had that sitting around in my shop and I turned a little bowl first and I really love the color and the, and the figure that's in it. Uh, this one also has sand, a pretty bad sanding deficiency over here on the where the end grain comes through on the opposite side from the notch. And I don't know, I just didn't understand. I didn't sand it well enough. 
And then I made a, a couple of these, these things. These are Richard Raffin style pots. Remember we had Raffin on, and this is kind of goopy in the finish because it's in the middle of being finished. Like it's going to get another hit of water locks and then it's going to get buffed. Um, and this was green walnut. Um, and I really, I like that idea of Richard's as a, as a thing to make. And he said he makes about <laughs> 10 or 12 of them a day. I don't know. Um, I struggled pretty hard with this and another one because what I can't do is I don't know what to do down in here. I can't get that smooth and I can't, I don't really seem to know how to sand it down in there either. So I'm really at a loss for getting a good finish inside a pot that gets wider from the, from the mouth. And this is about oh, three and a half, three inches tall, five inches, four and a half across. And then I made a vase out of them, some more of the yew wood. And this is about six inches tall. And you know, it's desperately thin at the bottom. I mean, if I do any more work down there to, to take the little dimple out of the bottom, um, I'll bust through for sure and have a nice tall funnel. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I can still get this back on the lathe and do some more sanding, sanding around here on the on the base of the pot. So again, that's the U wood. I'm sorry I'm waving it around. I'm not. I'm going to be more aware of what I'm doing. I'm trying to coach you guys the same way. Um, so that's where I'm at as a turner. So uh, you, you might have thought I was an expert turner because I hold this port down, but it isn't true. I'm a mid-range turner like most of you, and I wrestle with uh, form, and I wrestle with uh, making, understanding the wood correctly, and I certainly wrestle with that last bit of sanding that gets the wee wee little wee dings and scratches and uh, tool marks and little bits of torn grain out of there. I don't seem to have the patience or the technology to do a good job of that. So that's me on it. Very, very nice, John. Very nice stuff. Like those that grain. Yeah. On the, uh, do you get um, pull out on your grain, John? Not much. A little wee bit where it comes around. Uh, where it comes around, I try and shear scrape. I've been trying to teach right. myself how to do that. Little tip: if it's too bad, put some CA glue on it. Let uh, it dry. That hardens up those fibers, and then you can get them off much easier. Well, I think I'm going to put this little guy back on the lathe, even though it's finished, and uh, just do exactly that over here in this rough spot and uh, sand that off again and try and clean that up. It is such a pretty little bowl. Yeah, use one of the nicest colored woods there are, especially if you get some sap wood into the uh, timber as well. Yeah. So I took two logs out to Don's place or where he used to live. He still has a shed mostly full of wood and swapped them for another choice piece of a U trunk. It's about this big, this, this big across and about that deep. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. I haven't really looked real close at it, but um, a good swap. I gave him two pair wood logs. Does, is Hugh the one that's really, uh, I'm going to use the word loosely, poisonous? I don't know. They make uh, in, in the, the Oregon U. They make cancer drugs out of it. It's, it's a source of tax something. Um, the what we have around here in Connecticut, the deer ate them. They're like a landscaping shrub, a foundation shrub around the house. But he says these were from a tree that was about thirty feet tall, but it's still a U. So. So Don has a lot of- I once use. had a set of uh, dining chairs that were uh, the back, the back rest was a panel of English U and it was about uh, 10 inches wide. No knot, and just no figure either, just uh, straight grain. And uh, the, manuf the information on the chairs was just that it was English U. Uh, and I was told at the time that it did grow in trees in England, like 30 feet tall, like you're saying. Yeah. Always found in churchyards. Why is that, you know? It's because of the poison. They, they, they take them out of the fields over here, and uh, churchyards is the place they let them grow. Ugh. Yeah. The, the, the um, wood the wood is prized for people that turn fly fishing rods, the handles of fly fishing rods. Yep. Woodchuckers here in Toronto, if he gets you in, he sells it out instantly to the people that, that make fly rods. Yeah. yeah, it's a very nice timber. Well, there you are. 
Thank did you very you much. Say, did you say you had trouble with some pimples in the bottom of your bowl, John? Well, yeah, I, could, I just don't seem to stand well enough, especially where the heart, uh, the where, where the end grain comes around and, you know, is impacting on the tool in the most disadvantageous way. Sometimes I get a little tear out. Sometimes I just can't get the scratches out. Yeah. But what did I hear you say? You, there were some dimples in the bottom you tried to turn out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes I find I use a half round fingernail scraper and just very carefully go across the bottom with a wavy mo motion so that you're pulling up off of the taking the, the pip out of the bottom of the bowl huh i will experiment with that while you're talking don why don't you show us the slideshow you, you told me you have about um, power sanding i can learn yeah. from that right well, well it's not actually showing but i'm showing you the kit that i use here we go i'll come back to you john okay bert what do you have today well, just when we were talking about our earlier discussion about uh, having our first turning, this is the first thing I turned. And this was in uh, junior high school in 1965. And so we uh, made some uh, segmenting, glued it onto a piece of mahogany, a little piece of, uh, I'm not sure what that base was. Uh, I think it's a little piece of plywood. You can still see the screw holes because we didn't have chucks back then. And uh, uh, of course, this is just a dowel, it's a piece of wooden dowel, but uh, that was my first effort at wood turning. And then life got in the way and didn't turn for probably 50 years and now I'm back at it again. You did segmented turning in junior high? Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, it, was a, it was a fun project. Uh, it took a, probably it took a month's worth of classes to get it to this stage. And the interesting story on this is uh, uh, I'd given this to a friend of mine who lived in the town of Hinton, uh, probably in 66. And her and her husband had it on their mantle for, well, a lot of years. He just passed away here a few years ago and I was out visiting her and she says, here, you better take this back. You gave it to me and I want you to have it back. So this thing has went full circle. I finally, I got it back. I forgot all about making it, but uh, when she gave it to me, I recognized it immediately. Fun project. Wow. That's it. Okay. Thank you. How about you, Randy? Hi, John and everybody. Okay. First up, what is it? It's, it's like a bottle microphone. opener. And here is what it is. Uh. It's a uh, uh, like a support for your cell phone if you're using your cell phone. Set this down and it keeps the cell phone upright. Uh, and I have the first item I ever turned, which is this pen. Uh, I'm glad you can't see it in detail because it's terrible. <laughs> I keep it around so I know how bad I was. <laughs> uh, last thing is I have, I'm starting to make another batch of pens. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the batch of pens I'm making. And one of the things I had to do was I had to scuff all of these tubes to make the glue it here better and I'm going to stop the share and switch over because I know it won't work and I'm going to quit out of there and I'm going to go in here and then I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to restart again. Can you see that? Yep. This is how I make, I, I do a scuffing of a pen of about 20 or 30 pens at a time. Mm.
And that's to scuff them so they take glue better? Is that the point? Yes, yes. Uh, because, uh, and I'm gonna stop that share. And because uh, pen tubes uh, are drawn through uh, dyes and they put a lube on the brass tube. And so that inhibits uh, any kind of glue from sticking to it. Uh, if you don't, a lot of uh, pen maker, pen manufacturers have started selling pre-scuffed tubes. In other words, they come that way, but slim lines do not. And there are many other pens that do not, but as best practices, you should always scuff the tubes. Absolutely. Randy, I see you and I have the same type of lathe, the XP. I didn't know who else might have had one, the XP DVR. Yes, I just, uh, I have the original XP lathe and uh, I like it. Uh, I do wish I could get the upgrade for it, which has the knob on that allows you to pick, uh, to pick the speed, to run the speed up and down, uh, but that's a minor inconvenience. Yeah, uh, mine has the latest, the latest upgrade that they made for it, which has a knob. But... Yeah, mine is one of the old original ones. Yeah. And uh, I got a, a bed extension for it. I haven't installed it yet because the table it sits on, I have to make it six feet long. <laughs> it's only four <laughs> foot, so I have to make it longer. Well, that's sturdy enough. Just let it hang out over the edge a foot or two. It won't hurt. <laughs> That's kind of the way mine goes. So it folded down with the last two feet hanging out over. So I've thought about that. The problem is I like to make my handles on my lathe tools longer. And it's it with the original length of it, it's just a bit too short, maybe by about four or five inches. So exactly why I have mine extended. So I can slide everything down. I don't need to take it off. So yeah. So that's hey, it. Randy, I like your uh, dust collecting setup. Yeah, yeah. That was oh, interesting. Yeah. Can you bring that back up? Bring that up again, yeah. Here you go. Yeah, that's a uh, uh -huh. dust collection. Uh -huh. And a four inch dust collection and if you can see just the top there there's a lexine shield up there and when i put that over and cover it up uh, i don't normally have to wear any face protection and it sucks up all the dust all the ca all the chips the ca fumes don't even bother me what's that fastened to how is that mounted on the lathe what attaches it uh it, it's attached with uh four uh, rare earth magnets on the bottom to what the the uh, what where does it exactly stick? It's stuck onto the bedways. Okay. Oh. It just so. Sticks the can you show it again? Yeah. 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 No, that's it. Stop the video now. Just, just yeah. Right there. Perfect. Yeah. So, so what we're curious about is how this is mounted on the lathe. I don't, I don't, I don't see all of the pieces. Does it the box come up behind? Right down here on this base, underneath that is the rare earth magnet that's attached to the base. Okay. It just sticks right onto the bedways. Okay. That's a better solution than anything I've got going. And the tool, the tool. Uh, the tool post then slides underneath it, it looks like. Yes, yes, it does. Uh, if I made another one and I'm thinking about it, I'd make it a bit shorter. It's a bit too wide for that. But other than that. Uh, you mean shorter in which direction? Shorter in length. In length. Make it a little bit narrower than it is. It's about eight uh, some inches long. In, in Why would you? Why would you do that, Randy? Um, uh, it's, I, I don't really know. It's, it's a bit, just a bit too long for me to grab a pen mandrel this way. Gotcha. Okay. I can still do it. It's just a bit too long for that. And it would be 
Much better if it was like an inch and a half shorter. Probably sucks better too on the dust and dirt. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. Is that it from you? Yep, that's it. Okay. Uh, who's next? Toby's there next. Toby, what do you have? I have two short videos, it's a, if it's okay. They're about six minutes total. Shoot, go for it. We can just do one. Let's do one, then we'll do the other. Hold on. I lost myself. Here we are. I got a share screen. Share. You see in that? Yeah. Okay. So this is me. Can you hear me over those? I could hear you, Toby, but not now. Okay. Okay, this is how I turn a bolt, the inside of a bolt. If you can still hear me. Yep. yep. I'm going straight into the side grain there. What are you using? What's the tool? That's a 5 8 inch bow gouge. This is uh, maple I'm turning. If you go straight into the side grain, it turns much easier. You're not hitting the end grain that comes around every time. You do this a lot. So how long does it take you to excavate that in real time? Well, you'll see the, to the two videos are six minutes, so that's how long it took. Okay. And you're not at all worried right now about the bottom there. You're just gonna, you're just getting rid of the sidewalls. I'm getting to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right yeah. now I'm just taking out the center wood that I know is, is gonna disappear anyway. Well, right now I'm doing the edge, but when I cut straight in like this, Just clearing out the wood. Little adjustment. Is this a real time video? Yes, it is. It's real jerky on on Zoom. Oh, really? Yeah, it's jerking like crazy for me, anyways. That's it's probably because it's higher res than Zoom can handle. You know, to show on Zoom, it's better to show the video at like 540. Otherwise, it chokes the thing. Uh -huh. You can see what you're doing. Yeah, it just looks like you're doing stop motion. So Yeah. Toby, I, I recently read or something, saw it somewhere. The real reason for people putting steps in the bottom like you're doing there, does it make it simpler? To, to finish the bottom when it's in a, made out of uh, rough grooves like that? Uh, that's not the way I view it. I, I view it as you're getting to use the other side of the uh, gouge. So it, you save sharpening that way. Oh. Well, your gouge is rolled right over there, is it? What was that? It looks like it's rolled. No, it isn't. I see. Uh, reflections are hard sometimes. Yeah. So that's that's the initial. Phew. Wow. Uh, how do I get to the next one? I wonder. <laughs> uh, you can stop the share and then resume the share. I think it's probably the simplest. Okay. Uh, now I have to go back to here. The question in so chat, is this a 40-40 grind? Is it it's, is no, that, it's no, um, it's about 55 degrees. Let me share the, this is the second part now. Everybody see that? Yep. Well, okay. we got there, we got it now. So I'm, I'm just going to take it down to the thickness that I want.
You can see on the outside, I've already done that. And I'm looking down to get the right thickness the whole way through. I usually don't measure, but sometimes I do if I can't see the inside. How wet's this wood, Toby? It's pretty, it's pretty wet. I actually got it from a friend of mine and I put it in a uh, plastic trash bag and let it spalt. And then took it right out of the trash bag and put it on here. You'll see when it stops the spalting. Maybe I already did. I missed it. What type of wood is this? It's it's maple. It's vaulted. Nice. Okay. Oh, there's a little more yet. Must have been a, a little bump in there. Is a maple one of the best spalting woods? I've always associated it with good spalting, but is there other woods that spalt well? Uh, poplar does well for me. Oh, Hackberry, really? Hackberry, of course. Okay. But you got to force it by bagging it, right? Well, that helps. I knew it's, it started when I got the wood and it was still wet. I could see the spalting on the outside. So I just put it in there, trash bag. And then I checked it every week to see how it progressed. And it probably took a total of six weeks till it got to this point. And you, then you want to turn it because you don't want it to get dozy, right? Or right, you turn it funky. and then let it dry. That'll yep. stop the spalting. Yep. Okay. Could you spalt that by rough turning it first and then putting it in the plastic bag? Hmm. Well, I assume you could, but I'm not sure. John, that's, that's pretty enough wood. I'm wondering why you didn't core it rather than just waste it into shavings. If you cored it, you'd end up with two. <laughs> well, this is fairly shallow. It's probably four inches, so I, I wouldn't get a whole lot out of it. Plus, I had another stack of two stacks of wood in my in my shop waiting for me, so I wasn't too concerned about that. I did. I did uh, core other pieces that were had more depth to them. How do I stop my share now? Oh, here it is up here. Okay. So that's all I have except for this piece right here. This is my first turning. What's the story? When did you do it, and all and all that? Uh, March the third, twenty twenty two, or twenty twelve. <laughs> So like 10 years ago. And what kind of wood is it? This is walnut. And it's about, it's a little less than a quarter inch thick down at the bottom. It's narrower up here at the top. And it has a little foot on it. How That's well all did, I have. How well did you sand it? Uh, pretty good. <laughs> I think I went through all the grits from probably uh, 80 up to 400 or something like that. Okay, now, what I've you, gotten I've gotten better now. I usually start at 150, 220, and 320, and that's about all I do anymore. So that what bull you turned in the two videos is that you're going to turn that again, or is that it's finished turning? No, I, I did turn it again, and after that, I mean, you let it dry and then turn it again. So that was right. like a turn bowl, right? And, and okay, so it, what we it, saw, go ahead. what we saw was the rough out, right? That was the rough turning, yes. And so what wall thickness are you going for in that? That was probably about an inch thick. And that, that wood just worked very little, which was nice. But I, I usually like to make the finish as good as I can on the first rough turning, because sometimes it does work too much. And, and then I end up just sanding it and, and letting it that thickness. Huh. Anybody else on this topic? So Toby, uh, you said that you rough them out to one inch thick? Well, that one was, yeah. If it was smaller, it would be a little less than that. Um, I'm about to try that for the first time and come back later and turn the bowl for the second time. Um, I don't know how much um, change is gonna happen. I'm, I'm doing some chalices on using um, 
box elder. It's very green right now. And um, I guess I'll just leave the sides of the cup about half inch thick or so, and then come back later. Wow, chalice would be interesting because of the stem. Mm, I, I would leave it all pretty thick and, and box elder dries out fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And also once you do the, do the, uh, the rough turning, what, uh, you can just put it in, I, I would double bag it, put it in one bag and then a bigger bag after that, leave airspace in between so that it, has, it can dry out without cracking. Mm -hmm. But I usually do my bowls, I take newspaper and wrap them up like a, a Christmas gift and then poke a couple holes in the, uh, in the bowl part of it so, and then put them in the basement and let them dry for about five, six months. Okay. Thanks. The chalice probably wouldn't take that long though. Right. Okay, thank you. Hey, John, uh, yeah. Sarah had a uh, message in the chat. She wants to have uh, a mentor help her with a bowl, large bowl. And I was wondering about uh, maybe your open shop in LAW. I don't know that anybody who, uh, that's a pretty big bowl. What are you talking about, Sarah? What size bowl? It, it's pretty big. So it's um, roughly I mean, obviously the whole thing, it needs to be cut down, but at this point it's about 23 by 21, um, eight or nine inches, maybe even, it's pretty big. It's in my trunk right now, so it's hard to get out to, <laughs> to measure it. Um, well, it took two of us to get it in there, so it's pretty big. And it's a burrow? Well, I, that's what I'm told. What, what kind of wood is it? I believe it's maple. And how long is since it was cut and like how sound is it? Four years. Huh. And so what do you, what's your project? What would you like to do? So a friend of mine, she um, she wants this to make a bowl for her grandparents. It's from a tree that was in their yard forever. So. And you're looking for somebody to uh, mentor you while you do that on their big lathe because your lathe won't handle that is that right that's correct okay well you guys can get a hold of sarah if you want to get into get that project um, our lathe at the at the shop is a powermatic it might well be big enough to do it um, i myself have no experience with that and would not attempt to to help anybody do it it would be deadly um, ron sheehan regularly comes to the saturday uh morning the monthly Saturday morning and uh, Ron I think can do that kind of work I don't know who else but uh, that would be one way to get to sort it out if nobody from here takes you up takes you up on your offer uh, I send a note to Doug because he's up in the Lancaster with a big old powermatic Doug knows how to do that yep he he handles big stuff yeah, I, I did offer to to uh, help out, but we're kind of distant and perhaps we could meet in Lancaster. If, if it's a, an open workshop, I, I'd be interested in attending that and maybe we could do it at that time. We're I, doing I, do, a, I do a lot of barrels. I have a bunch of them. We're doing an open workshop um, on the second Saturday of every month right now. Uh, we've had two of them. They were both quite successful um, and it's. There, there's the Parmatic and there's three, uh, two small jets and one little bit bigger jet. Uh, the shop is not super well equipped, but there's a pretty good set of tools there and a grinder uh, and some chucks, but it's not set up to right yet to be four complete turning stations. That's what we need to do next. And the reason I'm telling you that is uh, we really need somebody to step up and first of all, inventory what we have. We don't really know what we have. Um, and then lay that against what we really need to have these become four nice little workstations. Um, so that's a good project for somebody in Lancaster who want to take it on. Bunch of blank looks. <laughs> I'd be happy to help. It's just I don't have the experience. I mean, I can help inventory, but I don't have the experience to say, what all you need because I'm still figuring that out for myself but I'd love to be a part of that process because I'm sure I could learn a lot um, if I have somebody that's more experienced and knowledgeable helping me through that and guiding me well I think step one is simply getting the inventory and uh, you, if you want to if you can make it on the on the December 
Saturday. I th let me just look at my calendar and see what the date is for that. I think it's December the 10th. I can make that work. Okay. And anybody else would like to make that work too? Uh, we do this. Uh, we had about a dozen people the first time. We had about eight the second time, and uh, seems to me we can actually have quite a lot of fun getting together in in this way on informally on Saturday mornings. So, open shop, Lancaster Club. Um, I guess since I'm talking about Lancaster Club, um, take the spotlights off if you would, Jim. Uh, yes. I should also mention that it is due season. Um, annual dues are thirty dollars to belong to the Lancaster Club, and for that you get about fifty coffee hours on that are entirely on Zoom, uh, plus a dozen uh, monthly meetings that are hybrid meetings that you can attend, or you can watch the video, or you can participate via Zoom, plus a dozen Saturday morning all live, no video, just purely wood turners fooling around in the shop and uh, showing each other how to do stuff and talking about wood turning. So those are that's what you get for your thirty dollars at the Lancaster Club, and if you don't live in Lancaster, um, the majority of that material is is uh, Zoom uh, and available to you in in that channel. So the way to easiest way to pay the dues is to PayPal it to me. Um, it goes into my own PayPal. I couldn't figure out how to get an official club PayPal, but I will quite meticulously uh, transfer it to the club club account. Do it as sending to a friend if you're doing that. Um, and if you do try to send it to me, notice that my the, my Gmail address does not have a Y on the end of my name. So it's J-O-H-N-K-E-L-S-E -E at gmail.com. If you send it to the poor guy who's got the rest of the name, who he, I don't know what he'll do with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or the other way is to bring cash or bring a check to uh, any club meeting. Dave Blyle. I uh, do a share. Go for it. And um, we have solved the, the club meeting. We've got a second, uh, an older laptop sitting there. It'll it just shows up as a, a one of the buttons on the ATEM. So it's very easy to share in the club meeting now going forward. So that's new. Go ahead and skip me. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to come back to Dawn. Right, let's try and see how I go get on this time. Okay. How's that? Got it. Hey. Okay. That's, that's yeah. great. Right. As I say, mainly I just wanted to show you my kit, which I use for power sanding. Now, this kit, as you can see, is a home wood turning, and it's my Simon Hope. And the beauty of this is that, as you can see, I have six pads in the front of the box and six boxes, which I've got 120, 180, 240, up to 600. And then the right-hand side, I have a two-inch pad. Now, over here, buying these pads individually in packets of 10 are something like uh, $3.50 American for a pack of 10. Well, over here, you know, that makes it quite expensive. So I can't, where's my arrows gone? They're there. Roll over. Or use your keyboard arrows. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Right. I bought one of these hole saws. Um, the teeth have been removed and I've sharpened it as a knife. I've put it on top of the box so you can see. And that is an inch and a half, the same as the little pads I have. And then I make my own from this Rhino Grip red line. Now I can buy this at $3.49 for a meter by 400, uh, by 100 millimeters wide. And I can get three across. And you can imagine how many I can get out of a, a meter strip. And when you're buying that at that type of price, as I say, three ninety five, and the club's very lucky we go out and buy it in two hundred and fifty meter rolls, 
and cut out up in the meters and therefore we get a much better price and well, just clicking now don how are you doing that are you, are you using that as a punch or are you driving it with a drill I, or what are you doing hold one second <laughs> uh -huh. does that answer your question john <laughs> definitely does <laughs> it's on how a solid often do you have to sharpen it sorry how often do you have to sharpen it cutting through sandpaper very very rare oh okay very rare if i do you find that the sandpaper resharpens it for you <laughs> it, uh, no i if occasionally i just run around with a, a diamond file just to take any burrs off because you're hitting onto hard wood um and what you end up with is the disc and it, this saves a hell of a lot of money because as i say you buy a pack of 10 this is only what four and a half inches uh of a piece of uh of that sandpaper or the brazif which is a meter long so you can imagine how many you can get out of it and it's easily done because that is a self uh uh, exposing itself detaching piece the right hand side goes into the my cordless drill sprung loaded and they just clip in and out now the beauty of this is that when you've got those six boxes when you've got the six then i've marked them one to six so that they go one two three four five six across the top so instead of keep on pulling the pad off each one as you want to change it, say from 120 to 180, you just pick up the, the, the whole pad, drop it back in a box, pick the second one up. And you only change it when you this piece of uh, paper has worn out. So you're saving yourself a lot of money. Now, I bought this in 2012. Now, what are the pads like? What are they, what, how thick is the pad and what's it made of and how flexible is it and like that? It's very f flexible. Um, you can s just see this one here, which is a two inch one, and it's about the same thickness. Um, it's made out of a type of soft rubber with uh, Velcro on it. And as I say, they're made by Simon Hope. The kit costs about 80 pounds, but in the end, you've saved yourself a lot of money because you don't have to keep replacing these individually as you keep pulling off and putting back on, pulling off. You know, you do that four times on a bowl, that's four times that you haven't had to do it. You may not have to do it for four or five times, six times on any one pad with a new piece of paper. Does does anybody know if a setup like this is available in the US market? The uh Rolox system that comes from the uh I'm trying to think if it's Wood Turner's Wonders. Woodturnerswonders.com. Wood I've got a link in the in the chat. Yeah, and they basically the the um the piece with the the head uh the kind of the support for the sandpaper that piece had a, like a plastic face to it and then each of the roll lock uh pieces that very quickly um i can buy a picture of uh, the night before yeah this is self-extracted this piece here hey don does anybody in your area play hockey <laughs> yes so run down there and get them to give you a puck and use that instead of pounding on a hardboard. I use the same process, but I use a hockey puck and I lay my leather or my sandpaper or whatever. And when I drive it, the hockey puck is like a, a quilter's uh, cutting mat. It's self-healing. I've had two hockey pucks and I've used them for like four years and they're still just like new because they self-heal when you drive your... Uh, circle cutter into it it uh it cuts perfect circle and it's a lot easier on the on the table <laughs> right thank you very much that's a good tip 
Well, as I recall, there's a whole bunch of sanding belts uh, sitting there along with the uh, wood, donated wood at the uh, club space. Um, and like the wood, you know, you take something, you give me a buck or two for the treasury. So. I mean, what could be simpler, really, and saves you a lot of money. And if you've got the meter length in your workshop, which you're cutting off the piece to sand with, um, you don't have to go out in the bad weather to buy a new packet. Now, do you, that pad conforms down inside the bowl. It doesn't cut divots or the edge doesn't cut in. Is that, am I understanding right? The, the edge of the cutter. Of the pad when the you're pad. using it. Yeah, it just comes around literally like that. That's just come off that pad, off the cutter as I cut it. Yeah. And then when I use my um, sander on a bowl, on the inside, I'm using it at about 20 past the hour. And on the outside, of course, I'm using it around about eight o'clock on the outside. Are you turning forwards or in reverse or both? I've only got one uh, way lathe, which reverse um, turns the right way. Doesn't have reverse on it. Doesn't have reverse. Okay. John, they also make those uh, with a wavy edge if you buy them commercially. Okay. Yes, I prefer the wavy edge ones. I just ordered some from, I guess it was Wood Turner's Wonders. Do you, do you have more slides, Don, or I'm going to go back to a gallery? Oh, that's it. Thank you, John. I'll okay. uh, come out of screen sharing. Yeah, I'll stop this here. <laughs> we'll get back to a gallery. Thank you very much. Just uh, after two weeks ago, I thought it'd be nice just to show what we you know some of us got over here. I really appreciate that. And anybody, would, there would, I didn't mean to cut off the discussion about sanding pads. Somebody was saying another source for these kind of things. Woodturnerswonders.com. I've got a link in the uh, in the chat. They've got a, the, that Rolock system that was mentioned. Uh, it got three inch pads, two inch pads, mandrels. Uh, it's got replacement Velcro. Uh, very reasonably priced uh, online. I look at all of that stuff and I don't know what to get. That's the trouble. I look at all the different densities of pad that are available. Am I after the one the softest possible or somewhere in between? What's the get get the get his kit? It's got interface pads. It's got everything. He's got a kit. Okay. I'll look at that. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Harvey Porter. Yeah, John. Uh let me just uh I oh I've got to do a share. I don't know why I don't see the share. Oh, here we are. Just a moment. Okay, so here's the uh um, that set up for the roll lock that I talked about. Um, this piece right here is the piece that's the insert goes into the mandrel. And I found that uh, you can get a two inch or a three inch mandrel. And I found that the two inch drives the three inch discs just fine. So uh, I just use that. And, uh, and I keep it organized with the different uh, sandpaper grits on a little um, door. And then inside the door, I have my spare uh, pieces of sandpaper uh, organized there. And you were talking about density. This is the one that's the normal density, which is fairly stiff. And then you add on an extra little foam pad if you want it to be a little bit softer. So that's that's the Rolox system. And I will mention, I think I mentioned before that the uh, um, uh, Harbor Freight sells a 45 degree angle drill and it's much more comfortable and works better getting into the bowl and it's only $40 uh, and I've since changed from my old Makita to the to the newer drill so that's it for me. Hey great information. Anybody else on this ever uh, endless subject of sanding? If you get on Wood Turner's Wonders uh, mailing list they have specials all the time so uh, and if you get them at a symposium, the prices are just incredibly, incredibly cheap. I think I've just got a whole drawer of miscellaneous stuff and that variety in it. I don't have it. There's nothing coherent about it. You know, bits and pieces it doesn't go together and make any, any, anything I can actually use successfully. Yeah, I want to ask Don if he keeps any of his old 
used ones? Yeah. So what does he do with them? Yeah. So old used one what, Jim? Of uh, the sanding discs. Do you just throw them away when you take them off the mandrel or whatever? Yeah. Oh, once, okay. they, once they've been used up, I discard, discard them and start with a fresh piece. The uh, sanding disc tends to wear mostly at the perimeter. And so uh, I save them a little bit sometimes to use when you're trying to get that fine line right around the foot and you're doing some hand sanding, the interior of the disc is often still got enough grit to it that you can use it for that purpose. Yeah, when, when they're only inch and a half, it's, uh, you could only just use it for a little while, I think, personally, but that's my personal view. But yes, normally I throw them away because they usually are pretty uh, naff by the time I've finished. Do you do a hand sanding step along with power sanding or do you just power sand and done? No, I do. I, I, I Although a power sand, it's good for getting you down to your nice finish. But then I'll probably come back in with 32400. And sand by hand and with the lathe on hand. or sand with the lathe no, with off? The motor running, with the motor running. The only time I would sand by hand is if I had a rough, rough part on the bowl or whatever I was doing and I needed to go with the grain to try to eliminate it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to share my experience with it. I've been sanding my whole life, I think. And what I came up with was... Um, the two inch discs, I really like a lot. And I bought them in four different grits, 80, 150, 240, 320. Well, I guess more grits than that. And also 400. But if you do the sandpaper on the item before, well, while it's running, you're always going to have some scratches on it. So then I use these uh, mandrels with uh, discs on it to get rid of the scratches. And I just start again at like 150 and then work my way up to 400 and all the scratches are gone again while it's running. If you have a spot where you wanna keep, uh, do differently, you can stop the lathe from going around and just sand that a little bit with a, that spot with a little bit higher grit paper and then resume turning it on and finish sanding it with your final pass. Does that make sense? Are you talking about like a pad sander, the same as we've been talking about here the last little bit, or are you talking about some other implement? No, the same thing that, that you're talking about. It's a two inch pad with uh, foam on it that, that you can stick hook and loop sandpaper onto. I bought two inch discs that, that just attach with the Velcro. Uh, they don't last very long. Um, so I'm really interested in this way to make them myself. But um, I use mostly 150, 220, 320, and 400. And, that, and that's good enough for what I've been doing. If, if you're turning small bowls, two inches is a good fit. If you're turning a little bit larger, keep in mind a three inch disc has twice the surface area as a two inch disc. So you get a better buy, you get more sandpaper. Uh, less switching out with a three inch disc if it will fit the inside profile of your your bowl. Right. Well, thanks uh, for that tip. The, I'm sorry. A real ahead. large bowl, I'll even use my uh, five inch uh, random orbit. Right. That's what I do too. And I have a three inch one uh, that I use also. I bought it special when I was building pool tables for certain parts of the pool tables. So I have a three inch. Uh, Dynabraid sander runs on air, and um, so I use that whenever I can use it. To also, Carl, so Mike, I don't know if it would fit in your example, but I'm going to try that. The three-inch Dynabraid. Carl, let's go. Last word. You have to. Unmute. Uh, I was just going. Thank you. I was just going to confirm Mike Pease's uh, comment on the surface area. I had my grandkids do that for pizza. And you'll be amazed at the difference in diameters when you calculate the total surface area. And also, I might suggest uh, cleans pour for uh, surface uh, for sanding material. They're just up the road here in uh, Hickory, North Carolina. 
that's the kind of go-to place for industrial grade, you know, crazy long, wide, big belts, and also for surface sanders. But um, they have their bargain box uh, of uh, rolls. And uh, I don't know, I think it's just one of the, and also for forging, if you do any metal sanding and sharpening, they have the blue zirconia say. But um, love, your, love your club, John, just a suggestion. <laughs> What's the name again? Klingspor. Klingspor. Yeah, they're sanding specialists, industrial sanding specialists. Klingspor. Yeah. Kling, yeah. They have K -L -I. a cutoff, uh, like he was talking about. It's called the Wood, wood Turner's Bargain Box, and, and you get all these cutoff rolls. Uh, it's kind of like Forrest Gump, though, it, 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 with a box of chocolates. You never know exactly what you're going to get. <laughs> Actually, I should have mentioned, too, John, that I buy all my sandpaper from, from Klingspor. I've, uh, I've been using it for years and I really like it for a lot of reasons. Well, on that note, kids, it's a, been a very fun hour again. Thank you very much for all who participated and show up and uh, show your support just by being here. Um, we'll, we'll skip next week for Thanksgiving. Um, I'm grateful for all of you and we'll see you again in two weeks. Yep. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Take care, Thank you. John. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Yeah. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye. And you all take care. Wood shock.